Hello, nice to be here. Um, so I'm going to try and translate what I'm learning from the world of fast growth startups, the VCs, the research labs. I was at ETH in Zurich last week. I'm going to try and get their sense of how to make the most of the opportunity you have, but maybe the need to change some of the ways you operate to make the most out of where technology is going. Um, I was in Munich on Friday, and I ran, I ran into a YouTube star who makes videos about driving cars fast. His name is JP Kramer. He's actually had 400 million views. And I said to him, OK, JP, I commissioned myself, actually. I commissioned myself with my iPhone. I said, OK, I'm about to go and meet you know, the creme de la creme of the broadcasting industry. You're a guy who's worked out how it's changing. What would you tell them? This is what JP has as a message for you. So you're now running one of the big TV networks. You have the budget that the BBC has, that Channel 4 has. Yes. What are you going to do with it? First of all, I don't think I will need that real big budget because what people really like in the moment, maybe it's a trend, is that people want entertainment that it looks real. Maybe some of the people from TV, they want big explosions here and something is falling down here and an airplane flies over the whole situation because it's big. I think that people don't want it and don't need it anymore. So they want authenticity. But some of these people have major successes on their hands. They have like nine or ten million people watching what they Who? do. Some of these TV networks. Have. Absolutely they do. How I many do you have? I have 25 million every month. And I'm doing it just right out of my little workshop and office. How big is your team? Well, my team is now overall, because you can make so much money in so many different ways. 50 people work for me now. I have different 50 employees. And it is not really actually a small company, it's 4,800 square meters. But still, this all came not from TV, all this came from YouTube. Because I did TV, or I do TV now, eight years. Yeah. And the success you have by, just as a person, from TV compared to YouTube, really made a step of over 500% just by doing YouTube. And I will now stop doing TV because TV is old and I'm really not interested in doing it anymore. Because the main problem is, I can say that because it's not for Germany, the most people from TV, they want to keep the money. When you do YouTube, it's all yours. It's one man's view, you can challenge it. Um, but it's representative of a major shift that's happening everywhere with tech platforms, you know, Musical.ly has come from nowhere and huge numbers of people are swapping videos of lip syncing along to songs. In China in particular, um, the popularity of people broadcasting their day live and asking for tips has become so great that the government has banned the eating of bananas during these live broadcasts because um, let's say women are using it to Flirt their way. I'm not going to show this. This is a family audience. <laughs> As Andrew said, the big tech companies are moving into their view of what television could be. Zuckerberg, actually, um, he's done a keynote recently at the developers conference F8 in which um, he thinks you don't actually need the physical box in the living room. We're sitting here and we want to play chess. Snap, here's a, a chess board and we can play together. Uh, you want to watch TV, we can put a digital TV on that wall, and instead of being a piece of hardware, it's a $1 app instead of a $500 piece of equipment. And that $1 app, obviously, he wants to own. The places you can consume this amazing content that you're all creating, well, it's getting a bit messy. There are now sites just to tell you, if you're in a hurry, are you able to find something to stream? So um, my world, the world I got to know through Wired, is the people trying to disrupt you, trying to eat a bit of your lunch, trying to see opportunities based on people's behavior changing, but also new kind of business models. And I'm going to give a sense of what they're telling me about where they see this opportunity. Because I'm in a world where there are literally flying car companies getting funded. This is one in Germany that got $90 million a couple of weeks ago. It's called Lilium. This will be your taxi. And it's not the only one. There's another one in Germany called Volocopter. You can get to Heathrow Airport from the center of London in 10 minutes. 
The battery's only got about half an hour's worth of power. Um, but we are in the world of science fiction becoming just another consumer product. And I'm interested not in technology, but how technology changes culture and behavior. So drones are interesting to me, not because of drones, but because they create new kind of sports, drone racing. You wear the virtual reality goggles, you get the point of view of the front of the drone. Some of Andrew's colleagues in other bits of Sky have now paid for the rights to one of the drone racing leagues because this has come out of nowhere to become a sport. And I'm constantly having to rethink my assumptions of you know, what these guys like Elon are doing. Um, okay, so he's doing reusable rockets, and okay, he's doing some very cool cars. But actually what's interesting are some of the new companies people like Elon are starting. He's just started a company that he's running called Neuralink that's trying to connect the brain directly to the machine so you don't need voice or fingers on keyboards. And there is a website for Neuralink, which he's funding, and the sorts of jobs they're recruiting on the home page of the website are fascinating. Mechatronics engineer, microfabrication engineer, medical device engineer. I don't know if it's scientifically possible, but companies like this are trying to create the brain-to-computer interface, which is gonna change the rules yet again. So, the only certainty I'm seeing is that exponential curves, the doubling and doubling of progress keep on. And I keep seeing exponential curves everywhere, not just in storing data. I'm seeing them in you know, the price of Bitcoin. I'm seeing them in the, this is Bloomberg, the number of times companies in their quarterly earnings reports are mentioning artificial intelligence. Suddenly every company has to be an AI company. I'm seeing them in the falling cost of things like sequencing human DNA on a logarithmic scale, something that was $100 million 15, 16 years ago is now a couple of hundred dollars, soon the price of a cup of coffee. This changes medicine. This also changes how the state tracks its citizens. And of course, it changes behavior. Something that we couldn't have had because of exponential curves not inflecting till a couple of years ago and now mainstream. In 1994, Microsoft, which has a very nice research department around the corner, decided to solve voice. It wanted to teach the network how to understand human voice. The first year, it failed completely, 100% failure rate. By 2013, they got it down to 23% failure rate. Earlier this year, because of that Moore's Law curve, it was as good as human voice. And it's where it changes behavior. Now the expectation increasingly, especially for younger people, is, well, I need to talk to that device. Because we're not rational. Our behavior is a bit unpredictable. Somebody posted a question on the chat forum Reddit a couple of years ago. If somebody from the 1950s suddenly appeared today, what would be the hardest thing to explain to them about modern life? My favorite answer was, I have a device in my pocket that's capable of accessing the entirety of information known to man, and I use it to look at pictures of cats and to get into arguments <laughs> with strangers. And I would argue that your viewers are not necessarily rational. You have to watch behavior. Technology leading to strange behavior has forced us to redraw Maslow's entire hierarchy of human needs. <laughs> um, so I'm gonna answer or attempt to answer based on talking to people one question, which is based on all the amazing assets you have that maybe you're not tapping in their entirety. What would the startups do if they had access to the resources you have? Um, and I'm going to give you five points. And the first one is the power of data to transform businesses. And I'm not sure that you are capturing all the data. I mean, we can talk about the internet of bums on seats watching screens. There are all sorts of signals that you could be capturing from the viewer's response. You could be personalizing a lot more of the programming because it's power. There was a company out of Tel Aviv that Facebook bought about four years ago, called Anavo. You download the app, the promise was it will squeeze the bandwidth of everything you're doing online on your mobile phone, so you'll save money on your data, and it will send it via its own service, so it'll be much more private. Facebook buys it because they realized it gives them access to people's behavior on their mobile phones at scale, so they can get early insights onto some of the bubbling under startups that are growing very fast. There was a company recently called House Party, a social network, that was booming. Facebook knew first and then starts replicating some of its 
models. They tried to buy them. When they couldn't, they just copied. Because through the data tracking of this stealth app called Inavo, they had access to this. There's a strangely high value company called WeWork that doesn't own buildings, but it rents out leased office space. It's been valued at more than $20 billion. What's very interesting is when they were asked by Back Channel, part of Wired recently, to account for that valuation, they explained actually the real value is in the data we're capturing about how people are working. We know, because we have offices all over the world, the optimal amount of space people need, what time of day they're busiest, how to design physical office space. They think the real value of WeWork is gonna be in helping big companies, law firms, accounting firms, seat 500 people and save money on the real estate. So we're in a world where data gives hidden powers that maybe you haven't thought. I can name a whole bunch of tech companies that are now using the signals from your mobile phone, how many people you're texting, at what time of the day you're on calls, to see if you're a better credit risk. There are about 400 data points that one Hong Kong company called WeLend is tracking in real time. Even are you using the delete key whilst filling in the form about whether you're employed? All these things they can measure, which the algorithm can process. And I'll just give you one example. There's a company that recently got quite a lot of funding that uses satellites plus algorithms to count cars. And it sells this data at quite a nice profit to investors, to hedge funds. Why would it do this? Because it's counting retail car parks and comparing them with this time last week, this time last month, compared with similar size retail outlets, because it's getting access through that satellite and through the AI to data that those investors didn't previously had, which means way before the companies announce their sales, they have an advantage they can go to market with. They recently told their subscribers that um, an American retail chain, JCPenney, was in trouble. And in fact, the car count was nicely correlated with where the share price was gonna go a couple of months later. JCPenney then announced they're gonna close a whole bunch of stores. So don't forget the power of data that maybe you're not completely tapping. And the second buzz word that is, I'm afraid, gonna be mainstream is, you know, whatever we call it, artificial intelligence, machine learning. The ability to create a responsive way of understanding what people want to consume, how they want stories to be told, is growing in all sorts of ways. In fact, we've just got um, this Chinese company, Baofeng, release what it called the first AI television that you talk to, and it responds in all sorts of other ways. I just give you a sense of how quickly AI, because it's being democratized, the cost of accessing very basic machine learning is falling, is gonna hit all sorts of aspects of our life, driving a car. So this is part of the keynote that a chip maker, NVIDIA, gave at the Consumer Electronics Show in January in Las Vegas. The artificial intelligence network, the deep learning network, just by studying her eyes, is able to figure out what direction she's gazing. Maybe she's um, looking at, uh-oh, no, shouldn't do that. Okay, so that's called gaze tracking. And this next one is really cool. This is inspired by, this is lip reading. Take me to Starbucks. And so if your car is too noisy, and there are too many people talking, and yet you said something rather important, wouldn't it be nice if the, your AI car was able to recognize and read your lips? So if your car can do that, damn. If I'm a director or producer of a program, I'd want that kind of feedback. So one of the things that we didn't think AI was gonna be very good at for a long time is understanding emotion. We're now at a stage where we're getting really good at using these tech tools to understand what people are feeling. There are startups like Sitecore that can scan a crowd in real time. The little boxes don't just tell you the demography. This is a 35 to 40 year old Caucasian male. Um, it tells you degrees of emotional expression, degrees of sadness, of fear, of anger, of satisfaction. There are companies, this is beyond verbal, that can tell just by somebody's voice to the call center what their emotional state is. Apple bought a company called Emotion that was tracking 
exactly how responsive your face was and signaling all sorts of emotions. So there's a lot of startups playing in this space. I don't know why, as a consumer of your programming, I can't express my emotion to that story so it can customize a response to me. Even Dolby is in on the game, although I think the Dolby way of doing this is probably not the way I want to sit and watch Game of Thrones. <laughs> it gets very interesting. There's a company in Auckland called Soul Machines. Mark Sagar behind it is an academic, but he was also part of the team that I think won an Oscar for Lord of the Rings. He makes CGI people, not videos of people. These are all computer generated. And he puts them in machines with webcams and microphones that can hear and can respond. So they can talk back to you. Yes. They can do it in different languages in real time as well. Willkommen in Deutschland. And he's selling the services to governments, to health services, so you can have a patient inquiry line, and it humanizes that interaction. It's a fascinating company. Go online, they've created a neural network to see how a baby would learn. It's called Baby X. And this is another of their characters. She even has the basics of a sense of humor. I've heard it's party central here. Have you got some painkillers for the hangovers? Yes, definitely. Good forward planning. And this place is filled with suits. Do you get an allergic reaction to ad execs? You bet. I personally recommend picking up some allergy pills just in case. <laughs> Stay safe. But out it's there. responsive. It's listening and it's changing the narrative. So we are hitting the beginning of the mainstream of virtual reality plus augmented reality, increasingly being called mixed reality. Um, there was this little device that didn't get much coverage yesterday, but. There are some very, very big funded companies in this space. Some of them may not make it. There's one called Magic Leap that's raised billions in funding and we still haven't seen a product, but it's put simulations online that show how it sees maybe the way we'll interact in the future. All via focusing light just above the eye in certain ways. <coughs> We don't know where it's going to go, but we know it's an opportunity to create a new sense of engagement. And then there's virtual reality. One of the companies leading the way creatively is called Within. This is one of its immersive virtual films taking you deep into nature. They also through the BBC studios, allow you to be in space. There's a whole bunch of creativity that now has tools that can create a personal engaged journey. I think there's gonna be a more demand for this. And of course, it creates empathy like never before. Chris Milk, the founder of Within, among the other things he did was um, take you into a refugee camp in Jordan where Syrian 12-year-old refugees were living, playing football. You're in their world and you've got the ability to kind of walk through. There's no gap between you and the program maker. There's no gap between the stage and the audience. You are there immersed. Chris Milk calls it the last medium because there's no need to suspend disbelief. And so I'm seeing lots of this experimentation with 360 degree filmmaking. Keep experimenting because we don't yet know what people are gonna want, but we know the tools are gonna be democratized. And finally, I think this leads me to immersion in a more general way. I did a little experience where I was on the set of Ghostbusters shooting ghosts, because I was wearing virtual reality glasses, I was wearing a haptic vest, and I was carrying a, a rod that in my virtual world became a gun. It was an experience created by a company called The Void, which takes space in physical city centers, but it charges $30 for a 10-minute experience, which is a nice revenue earner considering how much we pay for cinema. And you can be anywhere and be on the set of Ghostbusters shooting the ghosts because now we can suspend disbelief. Now your programming needs to be out there in the world. This is at Comic Con. 
This is just one example of how Westworld was turned into a physical place where you could go and interact with characters. Because it comes down to the power of the stories you're commissioning that we need. Because we are irrational. There's a company I got to know in Beijing earlier this year. Two-year-old company started making and distributing games and realized that's not what people wanted. They didn't want to play games. They wanted to watch other people play games. Esports. Esports has come out of nowhere. They've created a league where you can pay to watch other people play sports. They're creating 10 physical stadiums in cities across China to create a premier league of esports that will seat 2,000 people, and you'll have IP, you'll have TV rights. Esports we wouldn't have understood just a couple of years ago, but got to go with people's behavior. And I'm going to leave you with a, a little clip from a festival that's coming up in New York in a few weeks called The Future of Storytelling. Um, there's a filmmaker called Karen Palmer who has been experimenting with how you create a really immersive sense of developing a narrative with people. She wanted to, after Ferguson, simulate what it was like being in a riot. So her film is called Riot. So if you don't use technology, you are not allowing yourself to access a lot of young people in a language which they are excited about. Riot monitors three emotions, calm, anger, and fear. The webcam will be watching you as you are watching the film and determine the average of your emotions. So your eye tracking will determine your attention and your interest. And in that way, the narrative will respond and follow a character that you're interested in. So you are watching, in essence, a bespoke film that reflects your reality. Is this the future of television? No. Is this a future of television? Don't know, but it's interesting. I'm going to give you one final word, which is, I guess, the risk of thinking it's going to carry on as it has, because, well, that's just how we work, and we have nice revenue coming through and still get 10 million people watching some of our great programming. Um, in the tech world, that's seen as an opportunity for outsiders to come along. In 2004, Fortune did a cover story about an Estonian and a Swede who created a business that was growing quite quickly called Skype. And inside, they quoted the head of tech for a telco, AT&T, who dismissed what they were doing as, it was like a toy. And then six years later, the New York Times did a big piece about this fast-growing company called Netflix, and they quoted the head of Time Warner, Jeff Fuchs, who said, well, it's like, is the Albanian army going to take over the world? <laughs> I don't think so. Um, and it was almost exactly 10 years ago when this thing hit the market. And the head of a big tech company that was making smartphones was interviewed on television about whether he saw this new iPhone as a threat. And this is what he said. <laughs> $500, fully subsidized with a plan? I said, that is the most expensive phone in the world, and it doesn't appeal to business customers because it doesn't have a keyboard, which makes it not a very good email machine. How did that work out, Steve Fulmer of Microsoft? Thank you for listening.